Welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element antimony. By the way, there seem to be two ways to pronounce the name of this element, antimony and antimony. Both ways are proper. I'm going to use the antimony pronunciation. Now, I have a nice big chunk of this element to show you today, so check, check this out. Beautiful. Nice big chunk of the element. Let's get back to our presentation, though. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which you can pick up from the online Exploratorium store if you want your own copy. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Antimony is the 51st element in the periodic table. That means its atomic number is 51. That's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as this unique element. While antimony does occur natively, as you see in this sample from the Harvard Museum of Natural History, we have no idea who first discovered antimony, but it may have been found as early as 3000 BCE. Antimony ore was quite common. Jabir ibn Hayyan, born in what is now Iran, is considered the father of chemistry. He's believed to be the first person to have refined metallic antimony. He's quoted as saying, quote, The first essential in chemistry is that thou shouldest perform practical work and conduct experiments. For he who performs not practical work nor makes experiments will never attain to the least degree of mastery, unquote an experimentalist almost a thousand years before Galileo. What is certain is that antimony ore was ground into black eye makeup called coal, and that was used in ancient Egypt as seen in the famous mask of Tutankhamun. This ore, antimony sulfide, is mentioned in an Egyptian papyrus of the 16th century BCE. Coal is still used in Africa, the Middle East, and India, as seen here on the granddaughter of this Varanasi food seller, and easily my favorite photo in this talk. There are about nine elements discovered before written records. Here you see which ones. Sulfur, iron, copper, silver, tin, antimony, gold, mercury, and lead. These elements were discovered so early because most of them occur in nature in their native state. The etymology of our modern name for this element is all over the map, and there's no general agreement as to its origin. The medieval antimonium, from which we get our modern word from, may come from the Greek antimonikos, or monk killer, since many of the early alchemists were also monks, and while the pure metal itself is not super toxic, some of antimony's compounds could cause problems. Another popular, though hypothetical, etymology is from the Greek word antimonos, or against loneliness, or not alone, because antimony was almost always found in alloys with other metals. Anyway, somewhere along the way, it became antimony. Antimony's chemical symbol, SB, does not seem to match its name very well, does it? The Latin word for antimony is stibium, from which the chemical symbol was chosen by Jans Jakob Berzelius. The primary ore of antimony, which we'll see in a couple slides, is stibnite. The universe produces most of the existing antimony in merging neutron stars, a pretty violent factory floor, with smaller amounts, maybe 26%, produced in dying low-mass stars. A new paper, just published, proposes that neutron stars had far less influence in the evolution of the elements in the universe. 
Here, you see each element square with a chart of its own, showing the element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at antimony, because it's special compared to the other elements. Note that antimony has more of that green neutron star merger process than any other element. Let's look closer at just antimony. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of antimony created by various processes. More than a third of the antimony present today is believed to be from merging neutron stars. Again, more than any other element. Note that the antimony produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started till a bit later. This is because low mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Here on Earth, Antimony is obtained chiefly from the mineral stibnite, which is antimony sulfide, sp2s3. This is the ore that is ground into that black eye makeup, coal. Museum specimens of stibnite are usually very impressive, massive collections of spiky crystals, like this one at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This one is about three feet across. Stibnite is one of over 100 minerals that contain antimony. Antimony is a silvery gray and, unlike many metals, is hard and brittle. Hitting it with a hammer would not dent it, but rather smash it into many pieces. It is not malleable. Antimony is considered a metalloid. It has qualities of a metal, but also qualities of a non-metal. In the periodic table, generally speaking, metals are to the left of the red line, and non-metals are to the right. Antimony straddles the line in qualities. Antimony has four allotropes. Allotropes are two or more different physical forms in which an element can exist at room temperature, like graphite and diamond for the element carbon. Only one of these antimony allotropes is common, the silvery metal I showed you at the top of the program. The others are not stable. One is called black antimony. Another is called yellow antimony, and the last is explosive antimony. The last two are rare enough that I couldn't even find photos of them. It's pretty obvious from this map that China is a major producer of antimony. The main suppliers of antimony are China, producing 77% of the antimony in the world, followed by Russia with 7%, then Tajikistan, Bolivia, Australia, and others. In the U.S., we import 84% of the antimony we need. The rest we get from recycling. We have no antimony mining. Since 1900, production of antimony worldwide has increased from under 10,000 tons per year to about 180,000 tons per year in 2010. The American Chemical Society's Endangered Element List places antimony as limited availability, future risk to supply. So, we should watch our use of this element and be sure to recycle it. The American Chemical Society's rating indicates the relative risk to the supply of antimony required to maintain our current economy and lifestyle. How common is antimony? Actually fairly rare. It's the 77th most common element in the universe, the 66th most common element in the sun, the 64th most common element in meteorites, also the 64th most common element in the Earth's crust, making up from 0.2 to 0.5 parts per million. You could compare that to 50 parts per million for copper, a hundred times more common, or 14 parts per million for lead. 
little more common in the oceans. It's the 37th most common element. And in us, in humans, it, there is none. The current cost of antimony is about $6.13 per kilogram. Given its rarity, I'm not sure I understand this. Gold is only slightly more rare in the Earth's crust and is almost $61,000 per kilogram. It probably has something to do with the fact that it's brittle, slightly toxic metal that is chemically reactive, whereas gold is inert, shiny, and malleable. Over the past eight years, antimony reached a high of almost $14 per kilogram. If you had bought it in 2002, when it was only a dollar per kilogram, uh, you could have made some serious cash if you sold it at the peak. If we compare the size of the antimony atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The antimony atom is less than three times the size of hydrogen. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are very small. Here are the sizes of the atoms sorted from largest, cesium, on the left, to smallest, helium, on the right. Antimony is a mid-sized to smallish atom. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 51 protons for antimony, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms, called isotopes, are chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 37 isotopes of antimony, and of these, there are only two stable non-radioactive isotopes. These two stable isotopes are found in almost equal proportions in nature. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek word isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of antimony occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of antimony, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More about half-lives in the next slide. The longest half-life here is 2.76 years for antimony-125. All of the radioactive antimony isotopes are so short-lived that any existing radioactive antimony must be made either in stars or nuclear reactors. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any of the isotopes from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. Hint, it's a power of two, and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by two. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half as many again, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice that there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Antimony is moderately dense at 6.7 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter, and I've put up a couple more densities for comparison. Iron is slightly denser than antimony at 7.89 grams per cubic centimeter. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When we do this talk at the Exploratorium, we have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do that until we're back in the museum. Our set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with tungsten at the top, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, 
to aluminum and magnesium. We also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, antimony's density, the magenta circle, is about 6.7 grams per cubic centimeter and is the 50th densest element between titanium and iron. Antimony has the 69th highest melting point, a moderately low 631 degrees Celsius or 1167 degrees Fahrenheit. There are 20 other solid elements with lower melting points. Antimony has the 61st highest boiling point at 1587 degrees Celsius. That's 956 degrees Celsius above its melting point of 631. A pretty small difference between melting and boiling. Antimony has the 36th highest thermal expansion rate. It expands one part in 91,000 for every degree Celsius in temperature rise. That means that if you had, say, a one meter bar of antimony, it would get longer by about one one hundred thousandth of a meter, or one one hundredth of a millimeter, when you raised its temperature by only one degree Celsius. That's a fairly low expansion rate, even less than iron. An interesting aspect of antimony is that when you cool it in its molten state and it begins to freeze and solidify, its volume expands rather than contracts. Most substances shrink as you cool them. Very few substances exhibit this expansion on freezing. Water is one of those substances, and that's why ice floats. Bismuth, the element below antimony in the periodic table, also shares this unusual behavior. Antimony is moderately hard, with a hardness of 3 on Mohs scale of hardness. It's harder than aluminum, but softer than iron. In this chart of hardness, sorted from hardest, boron, on the left, to softest, cesium, on the right, antimony is the 30th hardest element. Antimony is the 46th best conductor of electricity, meaning it's a kind of a poor conductor, actually. It's the 47th best conductor of heat. Again, pretty bad. Conductivity of heat usually follows conductivity of electricity because they both have to do with how hard it is to move around the outer electrons. From our periodic table of the spectra, we see that antimony displays a variety of emission lines across the spectrum. Though it's a bit hard to see here, the lines in the green are actually somewhat more intense. Putting a solution containing antimony into a flame displays a pale green color. Let's take a look at some of the major uses for antimony. Every time I start to examine an element, I have no idea what I'll find. I'm often concerned that I won't find anything interesting about the element, or that there's no interesting uses for the element. I was afraid that this might be the case for antimony. However, none of the elements so far have disappointed me. Neither did antimony. These are the primary uses for antimony. The largest is for flame retardants, followed by use in batteries and alloys, chemical uses, ceramics and glass production, and other uses. Let's take a look at some of these. One of the most important uses of antimony is as the chemical antimony trioxide. In combination with other chemicals, it's widely used as a fire retardant in electrical items such as textiles, leather, and coatings. I hardly ever get to use that transition, so moving on. One of the major uses of antimony is as an alloy with lead to manufacture the plates that make up the negative electrodes in lead acid batteries. These plates can contain up to 12% antimony. The antimony hardens and strengthens the very soft lead and protects against corrosion. Here, we'll build up a diagram of the inside of a lead acid battery. Inside, there are groups of plates that make up cells. Each cell produces 2.1 volts. One plate is our lead-antimony alloy, seen here in gray. 
The other plate in the cells is made up from lead oxide, seen here in red. These plates are separated with an insulator, the turquoise plate. The lead antimony plates are the negative end of the cells and the lead oxide plates are the positive end of each cell. The plates are internally wired in series to make a battery that produces a total of 12.6 volts. The stack of cells are connected to external negative and positive terminals. And lastly, the battery is filled with sulfuric acid electrolyte solution that connects the cells together and makes the whole thing work. Invented in 1839 by Isaac Babbitt, the now-named Babbitt alloy is made of tin or lead with some antimony and other elements. This alloy is used to form a solid bearing. Unlike ball bearings, the shafts that run through these rotate right on the metal Babbitt surface. Babbitt metal is somewhat slippery, and so the metal-on-metal -metal surfaces are relatively friction-free. Sometimes they're lubricated, sometimes not. This extremely large 50-inch Babbitt bearing is for a power generation plant. Pewter is a malleable metal alloy composed of 85 to 99 percent tin mixed with approximately 5 to 10 percent antimony, 2 percent copper, bismuth, and sometimes silver. Yet another antimony alloy. Before the laser printer or the inkjet printer, letters were placed on the page by pressing inked pieces of metal with letters molded into them to the paper page. Each letter was laboriously placed, one at a time, into a frame called a chase. These letters, or type as they're called, were made from a low-melting but strong alloy consisting of 50 to 86 percent lead, 11 to 30 percent antimony, and 3 to 20 percent tin. The formula changed depending on usage. The fact that antimony expands as it solidifies makes this alloy perfectly suited to the process. As your type is cast, the antimony expands as it solidifies. The type metal fills all the nooks and crannies in the mold, making a perfect casting. The antimony in this alloy also made the lead type much harder and resistant to wear. These letters take a real beating in the press. Slightly less laborious were linotype machines. Here the operator sat in front of an actual keyboard and typed the text. Liquid metal was instantly cast into lines of type that were mounted in the chase printing frames. Far less work than dealing with each letter individually. Again, antimony expanding on freezing made sure the type came out crisp. Like printer's lead, lead bullets actually contain tin and antimony to harden the projectile. Otherwise, the soft lead rubs with more friction on the inside of the barrel and slows the muzzle velocity. Also, soft lead rubs off on the inside of the barrel, and the barrel must be laboriously cleaned, and often. You can buy bullet metal in ingots and cast your own bullets if you're into that sort of thing. Moving on from alloys, Indium antimonide is a semiconductor used for infrared detectors. If you aren't familiar with the electronics, I'll bet that you've had one of these infrared thermometers aimed at you recently. Now you know what's inside. If you build a two-dimensional array of these sensors, you can make an infrared video camera. In this movie, Fran and I are only rubbing clear ice on our face, lowering the temperature of our skin. Lower temperatures are seen as darker. This is an exhibit in the Exploratorium you can play with, too. Antimony trisulfide is a black powder we previously saw as the mineral stibnite and the dark coal eye makeup. It's sometimes used in fireworks to produce white glittery stars in aerial shells and fountains. A slightly different form of this chemical increases the sensitivity of flash powder and sharpens the report 
or loud boom sound effects of shells. Nowadays, it's used less and less for flash powder as it's poisonous when vaporized and can usually be replaced by sulfur or completely omitted. Naples yellow is an antimony-containing pigment that artists can use, with the one drawback that it's moderately toxic if in contact with the skin, and highly toxic if inhaled. It's a chemical that contains two toxic metals, lead and antimony. Of course, there are substitutes, but an artist wants what an artist wants. Antimony can also be used as a ceramic glaze. The yellow fruit on the left and right sides of this beautiful terracotta piece, made around 1475, is probably colored with antimony. Medicinally, antimony was historically used as an emetic, something that makes you throw up, and as a laxative or purgative, something that causes you to quickly empty your bowels. Guess it got both ends working. One way to produce vomiting was with an antimony cup. Many well-to-do 17th and 18th century households had one ready to go. It was a small cup made of antimony. You pour wine into the cup, and after about eight hours, the patient would drink the wine. Because the antimony would have leached into the wine, the patient would begin to vomit expelling all the bad humors. Antimony was also used as a purgative or laxative in the form of so-called perpetual pills. The patient swallowed a pellet of metallic antimony, which irritated the digestive system enough to induce rapid evacuation of the bowels, but the pill itself passed through the person's system unscathed. This may be too much information, but antimony was a valuable metal, and the pill would be recovered, washed, and reused, hence perpetual pills. Sometimes these pills would be passed, no pun intended, from one generation to the next. While not the best medicine, this was certainly an innovative recycling method. This illustration from a very old text seems to show the simultaneous emetic and laxative qualities of antimony. It has been suggested that excessive use of antimony therapy may have contributed to Mozart's early death at just 35. I just learned an interesting fact about the vomitous virtues of antimony. Some rat poisons include the chemical zinc phosphide. When rats eat the bait laced with this chemical, their stomach acid reacts with it and produces phosphine gas, which is absorbed killing the rat. When you set out bait traps, you don't want to poison other animals, so to reduce collateral damage, an antimony compound is added that causes vomiting. Rats are interesting because they cannot physically vomit, so they're stuck with the zinc phosphide chemical in their gut and die of phosphine poisoning. Other animals rapidly throw up the poison and survive. Antimony does not occur naturally in the body and serves no biological purpose in human beings. We'll end today's talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about antimony. Outline eyes with coal. In the ancient tradition, forgo explosions. Thank you for watching Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. The next program in our series will examine another interesting element, tellurium. We hope you'll join us. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. We know that this time is challenging, but if you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www exploratorium.edu slash connect. Thank you.